Welcome to Spine Camp. I'd first like to thank you for choosing Bronson as your spine surgery place. Basically this video is designed to give you expectations of what's going to happen before surgery, during surgery, and then the recovery in the hospital and at home after surgery. This video is designed for not only the patient, but also those who are family members or anyone who's planned to help take care of a patient. We're going to start by reviewing some of the anatomy of the spine and the functions of the spine. Once we do that, we're going to talk about different sources of pain, specifically some of the surgical sources of pain, such as disc herniations or stenosis. And in some patients, there's instability as well. Once we talk about that, we're going to discuss a little bit about some of the different surgeries. Now, we're not going to be able to talk about every particular patient's surgery, but we're going to talk about some of those different surgeries and show you some different examples. Only you and your surgeon can decide what the, the particular surgery is that'd be best for you. Surgery is not always an option, um, but when it is, we want to give you the most information to give a realistic expectation after the surgery. We talk about different things such as pain. Pain is on the foremost of everyone's thought uh, with surgery because surgery is painful. We'll talk about the things that we can do both in the hospital and then at home to manage that pain. We also talk about what are the goals of surgery. Sometimes we can hope or expect that the patient's pain will completely resolve after surgery, but sometimes the goal of surgery is to manage the problem and prevent it from getting worse. We found that if the patient is better informed, they have a better experience with surgery and have better outcomes. Specifically, there are some things you can do before surgery that will help your outcomes or help you how you do with surgery. If your diabetes is under control, we know that you will heal better and have less risk of infection. If you stop smoking, that would be very helpful, especially if you're having a fusion, as we know that nicotine stops or slows down the bone healing process. In addition, a well-balanced diet is very helpful to improve the wound healing and recovery process. Finally, we'll talk about preparing your home for recovery. Uh, hopefully, this video will be informative and be educational. As always, if you have any questions, please contact your surgeon. Hello and welcome to Spine Camp. My name is Masako and I'm the Spine Nurse Navigator here at Bronson Methodist Hospital. It's my job to help educate you and get you prepared for your surgery. Today we're going to talk about the parts of your spine and the things that can go wrong, what your surgeon can do, and specifically we'll talk about the different surgeries. We'll talk about how to get yourself ready for surgery and what to expect here at Bronson and what you can expect from yourself after surgery. Your spine is made up of 24 movable bones called vertebrae. You have seven cervical vertebrae in your neck, 12 thoracic vertebrae in your mid back, and five lumbar vertebrae in your low back. You also have four fused sacral vertebrae in the very bottom. Not only does your spine allow you to stand upright and move, but it also provides protection for your spinal cord and nerve roots. This is how your brain communicates with the rest of your body. When the bones of the spine are stacked one on top of each other, they create a tunnel. This tunnel is where the spinal cord and spinal nerve roots travel. These nerve roots exit your spine and travel to all the different parts of your body. They not only control your muscles, but they provide information about our environment, like pressure, pain, and temperature. Each vertebrae is separated from each other by a tough disc. This disc provides cushion as the bones move and flex over one another. With so many movable parts, you can imagine that there will be parts that will break down. One of the problems you may be having is called degenerative disc disease. This happens when the discs or the shock absorbers start to break down. Disc herniations can crowd the exit path for the nerve roots, causing irritation. Arthritis can occur in the spine. This is called spondylosis. This is caused by the excessive wear and tear of the constant moving of those vertebrae over each other. This can cause inflammation, and that inflammation will actually narrow the exit paths for those nerve roots. We call that narrowing stenosis. Other problems with degeneration can cause the bones to have a misalignment. We call this a spondylolisthesis. That means that one bone has slipped forward over the other. This can narrow the path for the exiting nerve root, causing irritation to that nerve root. Adult or degenerative scoliosis occurs as the bones wear down and your spine will develop an abnormal curvature. This curvature can cause pain, difficulty with walking, and difficulty with breathing. We've talked a lot about the bones and the discs, but the main reason you're having surgery is for your nerves. 
As I mentioned earlier, your nerves are how your brain communicates with the rest of your body. This image shows the final destinations of all of those nerve roots as they exit your spine. A radiculopathy can occur when your symptoms show up further down the nerve root. For example, if you have a L5 nerve root compression, you may experience symptoms of burning, tingling, pain, or numbness in your hip and foot rather than in your low back. Now that the decision of surgery has been made, your surgeon will talk with you about the approach for surgery. He may choose to do a posterior or back incision, anterior or front incision, or a transverse or oblique incision, which is one on this side. It will depend on the type of your surgery and your medical history. No matter what surgery you're having, the first part will be the decompression. This is done to relieve the pressure on those nerve roots. Whatever is in the way, we will do our best to remove it and allow a clean path for that nerve root to travel. One type of decompression is called a discectomy. Here, we will remove a damaged portion of the disc that is blocking the path for the exiting nerve root. Another type of decompression is called a laminectomy. In a laminectomy, we will remove the back portion of the bone overlying the spinal canal. This will open up the space and allow the nerve roots to travel with less crowding. Part two of your surgery is the spinal fusion. Your body has the amazing ability to grow new bone and repair damaged bone. This is what allowed us to grow from tiny infants to the adult sizes that we are today. It also allows us to heal broken bones. Imagine I was walking down the street and I fell and broke my arm. I would put my arm in a cast and my body would knit the broken pieces back together. This is done without any thought from me my body knows what to do. Your surgeon wants to stop the abnormal motion between two or more bones in your spine. In order to do this, we must fuse them together. This is called an arthrodesis. We will harness your body's own bone building ability to make this happen. In order to do this, we will need to trick your body into thinking that there is a fracture that it needs to heal. And since we know fractures don't heal overnight, we will need to hold those bones still for a period of time. Most fusions will take six months to two years to fully fuse. In a posterior fusion, we will use a series of screws drilled into the bone and attached to one another with rods on either side. This will allow your bones to remain still as your body heals. But remember, I said we needed to trick your body into thinking that there was a fracture. So we will actually need to scrape a little bit of the bone to provide the damage that your body needs to heal. In the meantime, we will insert a bone graft. This can be taken from you when we did your laminectomy, but typically we mix that with donor bone. This allows your body the scaffolding that it needs to grow that brand new bone and eventually form the solid fusion. In an interbody fusion, your surgeon will insert an interbody cage or spacer in between the disc spaces. He will fill this cage with bone graft, and eventually it too will grow into a solid piece of bone. These x-rays show examples of posterior fusions. The one on the left is showing a lumbar fusion, and the one on the right is showing a scoliosis correction. If you are having an anterior fusion, the surgeon will use a bone graft or a cage to insert in between each disc space. He will then secure that cage with a series of screws and a plate or just screws. These x-rays show examples of anterior fusions. The one on the left shows a neck or cervical fusion and the one on the right shows a lumbar fusion. As you can see, your body has a lot of work ahead of it. We need to make sure that your body has, has the best environment for that new bone to grow. Nicotine found in tobacco and other products can stop the bone from fusing. Nicotine is toxic to the bone building cells. In fact, 50% of those who continue to smoke after a spinal fusion will not heal. High blood sugars found in uncontrolled diabetes can also stop your bone from fusing. This will damage the network of blood vessels that are delivering the new bone building cells to the fusion site. It is very important to keep your blood sugars in good control after surgery. 
And finally, inactivity can slow bone fusion. Your bones rely on the downward pull of gravity to trigger new bone growth. If you are inactive after surgery, you risk delaying the bone fusion. Now let's talk about getting ready for surgery. You will need to choose a coach. This is somebody who can provide assistance and encouragement for you after your surgery. You will also need to get some blood work and possibly an EKG. This is to make sure that your body is healthy enough for not only the surgery, but for the long process of healing. We may also need to get permission from your primary care provider or the internal medicine hospital specialist at Bronson to make sure that your chronic medical conditions are in good control. Also, having a positive attitude about surgery is very helpful. A lot of you have had chronic pain for many, many years, and it has affected your lives in many ways. You need to understand that surgery is not a magic cure. It is step one of many. Recovery is going to take a lot of hard work. It is important that you focus on the things that you can control and to set small goals for yourself. Focus on the steps that you can take to ensure the best outcome. About seven to 10 days before surgery, you will receive a phone call from the pre-admission center nurses. They will review all of your medications and medical history with you. It is important that you tell them about all the medicines you take, even the over-the-counter medicines. We will need you to hold your herbal medicines and vitamin supplements prior to surgery. Also, you will be asked to stop all non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, before surgery. This is because in the process of damaging that bone to trigger the fusion response, we are creating an inflammatory response. We don't want to take any medicines that would hinder this process in your body. Some examples of NSAIDs are Motrin, Advil, Ibuprofen, Naproxen, Celebrex, and Mobic. We would need you to stop these medicines seven days before surgery and up to 12 weeks after. Please note that Tylenol is not an NSAID and is completely safe to take. In the days and weeks before surgery, you should develop a plan for your recovery. You will need assistance with heavy lifting, arranging for rides, and any other responsibilities, such as child care and pet care. We will review ways that you can prepare your home for discharge. If you have any FMLA or short-term disability paperwork, please make sure the office gets this before your surgery. About 24 to 48 hours before surgery, I need you to do a big load of laundry. I want you to wash all the clothes, towels, and sheets that you'll be using. Pack some loose-fitting, comfortable clothing in an overnight bag, as well as some toiletry items. We will need you to shower the night before surgery. You can use regular soap, but please don't apply any lotions or creams after the shower. Please put on clean pajamas and get into clean sheets. Please do not allow your pets to sleep in the bed. This is to help prevent infection. You will be instructed to have no food after midnight. They will also give you instructions on when you can have clear liquids before surgery. Typically, you must stop your clear liquids four hours before your surgery time. On the morning of surgery, we will ask that you shower again and put on a clean change of clothes. Please allow plenty of time for travel. You may have clear liquids as instructed by the pre-admission nurses. Please bring your photo ID, insurance card, your CPAP if you use one. You may wear your glasses, dentures, hearing aids, but please bring a case for them to be safe during surgery. Please do not wear any jewelry, piercings, nail polish, or makeup. Upon arrival to the hospital, please make your way to the second floor inpatient surgery waiting room. Here you will be greeted by a staff member and they will bring you back to your preoperative holding area. The nurses will instruct you on cleansing with special antiseptic wipes, rinsing with a special antiseptic mouthwash, and cleaning the inside of your nose with a special nose ointment. The nurse will start an IV and you will also be able to meet with the anesthesiologist, that's the doctor that puts you to sleep and wakes you back up, as well as with the surgeon. They will be able to answer any last minute questions that you may have. Of course, your family can stay with you during this time. When it is time for surgery, your family will be asked to go to the waiting room and you will be taken back to the surgery suite. After surgery, you will be taken to the post anesthesia care unit or the PACU to wake up. Here, it is a very busy time. We will be checking your vital signs frequently. You will probably have an oxygen tube in your nose and you may have a surgical drain exiting the wound. 
It is likely you will not remember a lot of this time due to the medicines that we give you during surgery. Of course, your family can visit you once you are awake enough and your vital signs have stabilized. After surgery, you'll be taken to your room. Typically, you will stay on the neurovascular unit, which is located in the west pavilion of the third floor. At Bronson, we have all private rooms with in-suite bathrooms. You will have lots of members of your care team coming to visit you each day. Your surgeon's team will see you every day. This may include the resident, physician assistant, and nurse practitioners. If you have any chronic medical problems, the hospitalist will also see you every day. You will have a nurse and a PCA assigned to you 24-7. Nurses wear the dark green scrubs and the PCAs wear the teal scrubs. You, they will provide you with your direct bedside care, assessments, medicines, and mobilization. Our team of physical and occupational therapists will focus on safe movements and making sure that you can safely leave the hospital. The case manager can assist you with any authorizations with your insurance company and ordering any medical equipment. And I am your nurse navigator. Let's talk about pain management after surgery. We have to be realistic about this. You will not be pain free after surgery. Typically the first week is the most uncomfortable for most patients. It will feel very good to lay in bed and not move, but as we know now, this is not going to help us heal. We need to get up and move with the therapists. The goal is not to take away all of your pain, but to get it to a manageable level where you can still participate with therapy, but you're not too drowsy where your safety might be hindered. We employ a variety of modalities to help manage your pain, from medicines to ice packs, positioning, as well as some distraction techniques. This is your pain diary. It encourages you to chart your own pain levels and to take control of your pain management. As I mentioned, you should expect to be active after surgery. We've developed a care pathway that helps explain what you can expect day by day. The therapy team will plan to work with you twice a day and they will focus on having you move in a safe manner, getting in and out of bed, in and out of a chair, on and off the toilet. They will suggest any equipment that you might need to keep you independent at home. You are responsible for the post-operative surgical care activities. These will help prevent complications. First is the prevention of breathing problems. We want to encourage you to cough and deep breathe frequently. We will also ask you to use your incentive spirometer 10 times every hour that you're awake. You can do this 10 times in a row, once every six minutes, or once a TV commercial, whatever you choose. It is also important that you get out of bed to help re-expand your lungs. We also want to reduce the risk for blood clots. We need to keep the blood moving in your legs. It is so important that you get out of bed and keep the muscles active. We will also ask you to do ankle pumps. This is where you can trace circles in the air with your foot or just move your feet up and down to keep your calves active. While laying in bed, we will apply massage wraps or sequential compression devices that will inflate and deflate periodically. Lastly, we need to prevent constipation. It is very likely after surgery, owing to the reduced activity, the narcotics we give you during surgery, and the fact that we haven't let you have any food before surgery. We will encourage you to get up and move because the more active you are, the more active your bowels are. We have to give you narcotics to help reduce your pain after surgery. We will add in stool softeners and laxatives to make bowel movements easier to pass. We encourage you to keep a stool softener and laxative on hand at home for when you return. Your incision or incisions will be covered with a dressing that will be removed the day after surgery. Most likely we will close the skin with staples or sutures. Sometimes we will use tapes or even skin glue. Staples and sutures will be removed at your two week post-op appointment. You may shower after your surgical drain has been removed. Typically, this is about 48 hours after surgery. At home, it is important that you shower every day. You may not feel dirty, but we want to reduce the amount of bacteria on your skin. Use clean towels and washcloths on your incision. Please do not allow your pets to sleep in the bed with you. We want to keep the germs away from your wound. Also, wash your hands often and ask those around you to wash their hands. And if anyone is sick or not feeling well, please ask them not to come visit you. 
If necessary, your surgeon will prescribe you a bone growth stimulator. This will be delivered to you after you leave the hospital. I mentioned you would have a two-week post-op appointment to remove any sutures or staples. At your six-week appointment, we will be taking x-rays to check the placement of the hardware and to be able to see some bone growth. Keep in mind we're looking for the metal that's in your back but not the metal that's on your clothing, so be mindful of the clothing that you wear to that appointment. At this appointment, the doctor will be able to monitor the progress of your fusion and may be able to modify the activity restrictions that Rosie will show you now. Hello, my name is Rosie and I'm an occupational therapist here at Bronson. Your rehab team will consist of physical therapy and occupational therapy. For those of you having fusions, your restrictions will be four to eight weeks with no bending, lifting, and twisting. Non-fusion patients, your restrictions will be two to four weeks. Restrictions will depend on the level of your surgery, the type of surgery, and your ability to heal. For those of you that have Dr. Kasten and Dr. Elowitz, your restrictions will be for about 12 weeks after a fusion. Now, let's talk about your restrictions. We call them the BLTs. That stands for no bending, lifting, and twisting. Specifically, no excessive bending at your waist. Lifting, you're restricted from five to 10 pounds. And we like to think about not lifting a gallon of milk. We all know what a gallon of milk, that's about eight pounds. Twisting at the waist and sitting for more than 30 minutes. Because if you sit for more than 30 minutes, you know that you become stiff and this will trigger more pain. These restrictions are for your comfort and to avoid muscle spasms, but, but also to promote that healing that the doctor wants. You are not to drive for two weeks because you will be taking your pain medications, which are narcotics. Specifically now, let's talk about the next surgeries. You are not to drive for two weeks, and it's not recommended that you drive while you're on any type of narcotics for pain. If you are wearing a neck brace, you are not to drive at all until that neck brace comes off. Avoid pushing, pulling, or reaching overhead with your arms. And you can turn your neck side to side real gently and slowly. It's this up and down that the doctor wants you to avoid. Let's look at our body mechanics. We want you to change positions often. In bed, the nurses as well as us therapists will be turning you frequently from on your back to either one of your sides. We want you to be out of bed and to avoid prolonged sitting or standing. As you know now, if you stand or sit too long, you get stiff, it triggers pain. That is the same for after your surgery. We want to increase your activity. Walk, walk, walk. Initially, that means just getting out of bed and taking those two to three steps over to the chair, maybe the bedside commode, eventually to the bathroom, and then out to the hallway. We're going to encourage you to maintain good body mechanics throughout because we want to protect your spine. The next thing we want to talk about is your do's and don'ts, specifically some of the do's. We want you currently to be using a firm mattress to support your spine. We also want to look at how you lay in bed. And some of you need to be off some of your medications before going into surgery. So a lot of this is about pain management right now. But I also encourage you to practice some of these things because it will get you ready and prepared for what you'll be facing when you come to Bronson after your surgery. So we have a patient right here and she's laying on her side. And I want you to think about from the top of your neck all the way down to your sacrum. What happens up here affects down here. So the depth of your pillow is very important. So think about the depth between her ear and the bed. That's how deep your pillow should be. So if the pillow is too puffy, it's going to turn your neck up. And if it's too squishy, it's going to turn it down. So you folks specifically having neck surgery, you want to keep that alignment really nice. And those of you having low back issues, if you put a pillow between your knees, that eliminates some of the pressure of this hip wanting to fall forward, which is going to twist your back. 
and we will position you when you come back from surgery on your back, on your side. We'll even tuck some pillows right back here so you're not prone to twist that upper back when you're in your bed. But I encourage you to practice these things now. When you return to your room after surgery, you will be positioned on your back. This is okay after surgery. Now we've also talked about how you can lay on your side to protect your neck and your back in that sideline position. Now we want to also talk about how you can protect your back and be comfortable while lying on your back. As you can see here now, I have my patient positioned here and it's just as important when you're on your back, the depth of the pillow so it isn't driving your head too far back or too far forward to protect that neck. And also, when you immediately put a pillow underneath your knees, it takes pressure off your low back. So I encourage you to practice this at home now as a pain management technique as you have to go off some of your medications prior to surgery. We want you to expect to get out of bed the day of your surgery or following your surgery based on the time of your surgery. If it is a later surgery, more than likely the nurses will be the first ones getting you out of bed. But if it's not, us therapists sometimes are the first ones to get you up. We all travel with walkers. That doesn't mean you're going to go home with a walker, but it just means that it's a little extra support sometimes for you to hang on to when you get out of bed. You know, you're nervous, you're painful. It just helps eliminate some of that anxiety the first time you're going to get out of bed. Now we want you to be active, but that means we're going to do a little bit and then we're going to rest a little bit. Us therapists will be the ones to show you how to get out of bed and to do the normal things you need to to follow those spinal restrictions that you have after your back surgery. If there are stairs in your home, it's okay. When we come to your room and first meet you, those are some of the basic things we're going to start asking you. What your home layout is like, how many steps to get into your house. It doesn't mean we want you to do a bunch of stairs and run up and down them all day long, but stairs are okay. We have practice stairs in our gym and we will practice those with you. Getting out of bed, we call it log rolling because you can't do this twisting movement anymore. You need to roll like a log. So your ears, your shoulders, and your hips need to move as one to protect that spine as you're moving. So to do that, we normally have you, if her legs were down, we're gonna have you bend your knees up. And I usually stand here because I want you to know where the edge of that bed is. And we lower the rail down, we're going to put the head of the bed down because most of you don't have hospital beds at home. And with that, I'm gonna help her roll to her side. Now we want this top hand to stay right here because sometimes when you get painful, you go, ah. Well, you're twisting your back. So sometimes you need a friendly reminder to keep your hand here. We're gonna start moving your legs off the bed and then we're gonna have you push with that lower hands and sit up. Now, this arc of motion is very painful. I'm not gonna kid you about that at all. However, if you do it correctly, it's a way to control your pain. We are now going to show you how to get back in bed. You're sitting at the edge of the bed. You are going to come down on your elbow. Keep this front hand forward. Your feet and legs will automatically come up. And we might lay, keep you laying on your side. And we'll put a pillow between your knees. If it's time to lay on your back, then we're going to help you roll like that log and go on your back. And we, of course, will put more pillows underneath your knees because we want you to be comfortable. It's all about rest and managing pain. Let's talk about the cars. You'll need a ride home because of the narcotics pain medicine you'll be on, but let's talk about the vehicle that you will ride home in. If you can have a choice of the size of your vehicle, one that backs up pretty close to your behind so you can just sit down would be ideal because if I need to get into a big SUV or van and I have to step up, I mean it immediately makes my back twist and bend. So if you can choose the vehicle you ride home in, that would be ideal. And to do that, we're going to use this chair as a demonstration. If you can slide the seat of the chair back as far as it will go, and even take the backrest and lay it down. Then you can back up to the seat and sit down 
and even slide part of your bottom on the back of this so that you need to pivot and turn your body as a whole and you'll have more clearance of your legs to get into that vehicle. And again, we have a gym in our department right on the floor that you'll be staying in and we can go there and practice as need be. It's our job to make sure you know how to do the everyday things for yourself like getting dressed, getting to the bathroom, bathing, staying within those bending, lifting, and twisting restrictions you have while your back is healing. So let's review some of those techniques now. Adaptive equipment has been designed to be the length of your arms down to your feet where you can't bend. Your hands can come to your knees, but as soon as you go past your knees, your back is bending and you can't do that. So let me show you some things how to make life easier while your back is healing. So to get dressed, to get your underwear on and your pants, reacher. Anyone who has back surgery, I feel, needs to have a reacher. And to do that, be it your underwear, slacks, shorts, you would gather up a pant leg, use your reacher, shake it out, and you drop it down over your foot. You put it in, and you bring it up to your knee where you can reach. I didn't move my back, I just moved my arms. You would reload, gather it up for your other pant leg, shake it open, and put your foot in. Now keep in mind, it's always harder when you have pants and socks and shoes already on. So I would hoist it up to my knees, I would stand up with a straight back and hoist them up. Now, when you go to sit down, remember, your back needs to stay straight, so your knees need to be touching the chair, the toilet, or the bed, because when you go back with a straight bottom, you want your bottom to hit it. Now you can let gravity help you drop your clothes to the floor, and then you can kick them off a little bit, but your reacher is there to help you and to pick items up. Now the reacher is very good too if you drop something on the floor. If you get hot with your covers, it can pull and pull things off. So again, I think a reacher is very important for anyone who has back surgery. Let's move on. Putting your socks on. A stocking aid has been developed. Now a stocking aid will work with a footy, an anklet, or even a knee high. But what you need to remember is the toe bed needs to be all the way to the end. And then it gathers. There will be more gathers here if the sock is longer. Just do not let it fold over. And the reins, you toss it down over your foot, you put your toe in, and you pull it up. And you keep pulling and pulling until it comes out. You drop one rein, and you never moved your back to get that sock on. Now to get that sock off, the reacher again has this little nubby on it, or you can use the end or here and it can push off a sock quite nicely. And then you can pull your sock and it is off. Now to get your shoes back on, there's long handled shoe horns. Some of you might have already gone to slip on shoes to make things easier, but a shoe horn will help you do that. Now you might have noticed I have lace-up shoes. There are things called elastic shoelaces that I'm going to pick up my shoe and show you. I used my reacher, I didn't bend my back. There's elastic shoelaces that you can tie your shoe and it will give as you slide your foot in and then it recoils back when you put your foot in. Now I've also figured out that if you tie your shoelaces, the tightness you like it for the first three, leave them a little loose, that is why I could slide my shoe on without untying them. And it is not sloppy on my foot at all. So a shoe horn is another nice thing to have. As earlier was told to you by the nursing staff, they're going to want you to get into the shower and get your incision wet. You are not to scrub on it, 
but you also can't bend down to get the other parts of your body. So we'll talk to you about your bathroom setup, whether you might need a tub seat. But again, there's long handled pieces of equipment that help you wash and reach the places you cannot bend over to get. And lastly, toilet tongs. You cannot bend behind to wipe your behind. So we will specifically talk to you about these pieces of equipment individually after your surgery. Let's now talk about getting your house ready to come home after your surgery. Fall risks. Some of these things to me are common sense, but let's review them anyways. Cords. Pick up any cords that could be trip hazards. Extra furniture. Loose rugs. Steps that have rickety rails. Your pets. I want to specifically talk about your pets. Your pets are going to be really happy to see you come home, but before you come into the house, I'm going to encourage you to restrain that animal in a different room, in their crate. You get in the house, you get situated, and then release the animal to come see you. I would hate for an uh, accident to happen with the dog being or cat being excited to see you and knocking you over. Us therapists will talk about your bathrooms, your toilets, your tub, your showers. Whether you're going to need a riser on your toilet, maybe a tub transfer bench, or just a seat in your shower to help you while you're following your back restrictions. But again, we will talk to you individually about these as they relate to you. Think about where you put things in your home environment. We don't want you reaching up into upper cupboards because that's going to make your neck go up too high. You're not supposed to be lifting high to low or bending over to pick things up. So things that you use frequently, please bring them down to like tables or countertops and just let them be out in the meantime while your back is healing. Think ahead for meals. You might want to make ahead some meals, put them in the freezer, have people prepared to bring you things just so that you can really focus on yourself and getting around and just doing those everyday things once you return home. You aren't going to be allowed to do heavy things like laundry, shoveling snow, raking leaves, gardening, vacuuming. You're going to need help with those once you go home. Those are all out of your lifting restrictions and probably twisting too. Sometimes when you leave here, if you're just not moving well or you don't have a lot of folks at home to help you, particularly if you live alone, we might visit whether you need to go to some rehab after you leave here just to get your strength, your mobility back before you go home. We're going to would like someone to stay with you for one to two weeks once you return home and you're definitely going to need a ride home once you leave here. Thank you for taking the time to watch Spine Camp. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to call your surgeon's office.